And so I welcome you all. Uh, my name is Harvey Kuyani. I work as a CEO of Global Connections, a mission organization here in the UK. Um, and I'll be your facilitator tonight. Looking forward to having a good time with you. This particular focus, this particular seminar today focuses on uh, faith, hope, and health. Uh, and it will be discussing the WHO strategy for engaging religious leaders, faith-based organizations, and faith communities in health emergence, emergencies. It's part of a series in the HOPE Consortium, which asks, among other things, does the experience of the pandemic share perspectives of HOPE across local, national, and global scales? And do how do we do how do multilateral organizations, national and subnational governments, and religious institutions, community organizations think about hope. The series builds on Dr. Indrajit Roy's current project at York, um, and we'll explore with colleagues at the WHO and elsewhere the ways in which hope is understood by actors in institutions and societies across various scales and geographies. Today, we, we will be investigating the following interrelated topics, hope and health. How does the experience of the pandemic shape the perspectives of hope across, uh, across local, national, and global scales? Imagining hope, what have been the cultural expressions of hope in the wake of the pandemic? We are particularly keen to explore this question in the context of political, economic, and social crisis within the pandemic within which the pandemic is embedded in different countries. Hope and social change. What are people's sources of hope in our uncertain times? We're especially keen to explore examples of collective action, social movements and so, so, civic solidarity that construct hope. We have three exciting speakers. Um, we have Dr. Sally Smith, Dr. Mai Makoka and, and Dr. Ben Brown Walker. We will start with uh, Dr. Sally Smith, um, who is a senior advisor with the World Health Organization, a visiting lecturer at the University of Leeds, and the coordinator of Anglican Health and Community Network. Her 30 plus years career in global health development and religion, community engagement, and HIV began in Nepal working for 16 years in a community health development, HIV and SRHR. I think she'll explain what that means. Followed by 14 years at uh, United Nations AIDS, um, uh, let, literally a senior advisor for community and engagement on HIV with focus on faith-based organizations. In 2018, she gained a doctorate in practical theology at Glasgow University. Her thesis entitled, is entitled Religion in the United Na Nations, Political Declarations on HIV AIDS and Interdisciplinary Critical Discourse Analysis. It explores the conflicts and tensions between public health approaches to HIV and SRHR, political discourses of secularism and conservative religion within the four practical declarations on HIV AIDS adopted by the United Nations in 2001, 2006, 2011, and 2016. Dr. Smith qualified as a nurse in 1980 and gained a master's degree in health education and health promotion in 1994 at Leeds Metropolitan University, now Leeds Beckett. She is a founder and leadership council member of the Joint Learning Initiative on Faith and Local Communities. Welcome, Dr. Sally. You can take over. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. And I want to extend uh, thanks very much to the uh, uh, Global Health Histories Programme at York, to Professor Sanjoy, Professor Indrajit Harvey, and, and many other colleagues. Thank you for the invitation to present today. It's a pleasure and a joy. And uh, it's conversations like these, I think, that, uh, that give me hope uh, that we can talk together about some of the really important things. So thank you very much. 
Uh, just as Harvey said, I've been working over the last couple of years as an, an external consultant to the WHO uh, emergencies team, and I've been working within what they call EpiWin, uh, which is uh, a team in WHO working on uh, convening networks uh, of civil society, of youth groups, of faith, and of um, partners in the world of work uh, to help inform and shape some of the messaging around um, the prevention of the COVID pandemic and moving forward around the engagement of the um, uh, faith actors, particularly over the others as well, in promoting the uptake of vaccination. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. At the moment, I'm just between contracts and working alongside Alex and Sarah. So it is a joy to, uh, to represent the team today. So I think Alex has kindly offered to share my slides. Um, so this presentation is, is quite short. What I wanted to do was to just give you an overview of the work that we've been doing over the last two years, but particularly to focus on the strategy, uh, which I think is, a, is again, a cause for hope and a, a, a very exciting step forward. Uh, so next slide, please. So early uh, in, in late 2020, fairly early into the, uh, the pandemic, um, the team at EpiWin established three communities, interfaith communities of practice. Uh, and we, we had uh, worked with an original list of faith-based partners that the department already had from working on previous pandemics. We then expanded that list through a snowball methodology to include other faith partners and expand the participation of different groups. Uh, and they then established these three communities of practice based around uh, what, the, what the group said that they felt were important issues to address together. Um, the idea was the first one was on communications and advocacy. And initially that was very much at looking at the messaging that was going out around uh, preventing uh, COVID and how we could work with religious and faith communities as their houses of worship were shutting down in some of the lockdowns. Uh, and how we could also uh, learn from one another. So that was the first one. The second one was on research and learning. Uh, and the idea of that was to, uh, to initially to have some formal research projects, but that quickly became uh, not possible as, as formal research in the field was, was not possible. Uh, but we looked then at bringing together partners to have cross, uh, cross learning across the different groups that were working on the pandemic through different faiths, different uh, geographic communities. Uh, and so that group did some very exciting work around learning from one another and we'll be moving forward to document some of that work. And the third one was to develop this strategy for engagement of faith based organizations in the work of uh, the World Health Organization in pandemics and epidemics. And so um, uh, we can share the document with you. It's on the website. It's now been agreed uh, and it's formally a part of the, um, it will come under what they call FENSA, which is the framework for engagement of non-state actors with WHO, uh, which is a formal document that was agreed by the member states. Uh, and there is a provision for that for engagement of civil society and that the, the mechanisms for that are currently being uh, expanded and, and articulated. And so uh, this strategy for the engagement of faith-based partners will contribute to the overall strategy of engagement of uh, civil society actors. So the guiding principles of the partnership are that it would be based on two way dialogue and listening to one another. It's not about one sort of group telling another how to do things. WHO sets the norms and standards around the pandemic and how we need to respond. But at the same time, in doing that, we need to work together in figuring out how that's going to best work at a community level with the communities that, that many of you are working with. And that's also based on mutual respect. Science is tremendously important that we have accurate evidence informed information in responding to a pandemic and that science gradually evolves as the pandemic appears, we don't have all the information at the beginning. Uh, and as more research is done into what how the disease is transmitted and what are the most effective ways of preventing transmission, then the guidance will uh, be augmented and, and strengthened as more evidence becomes available. Uh, at the same time, there are principles of the way faith communities work. They have religious traditions, they have practices, and they have deep roots in community. And so one of the principles of this partnership is that we respect one another. We don't undermine one another's uh, scientific evidence or religious belief. And we'll see as we move forward, and if you get the chance to look at the, the full document, how that's articulated in, in, in the strategy. The purpose, much of this, is to nurture trust uh, in a pandemic, we need to, to have the opportunity to trust the information that we're being given and to know that it's trustworthy. Uh, and when we're getting such a deluge of information and communities are getting a deluge of information from uh, the internet and all kinds of different sources, how do you know what to trust? And so by working between WHO, Ministries of Health and 
uh, the faith community as well as other trusted civil society leaders, then people know that the information that they can trust, they know where they can go to get that trusted information. And that the principles of our partnership are that they will be open and transparent and adapt as we move forward. We'd work together in support of joint health goals and that it, it reflects the whole of society response that WHO has engaged in pandemics. It's not just about health workers going in to fix something. The whole of society, as we've seen in COVID, has to respond to this pandemic in order for us to be able to control it effectively. And again, for, for us, the, the importance of re, uh, engaging a diversity of faith partners. So the next slide, please. <clears throat> So the Director General, uh, Dr. Tedros, engaged early in the pandemic in early 2021 in a high level dialogue with religious leaders, uh, which was hosted by Religions for Peace. And that was the first time that we're aware of that a Director General of the World Health Organization has had uh, a, a formal dialogue with an interreligious uh, set of partners. And that was very important. He spent a long time listening and uh, he was given talking points, but it, when the host invited him to, to make some interventions, he says, can I listen some more and, and listen some more and then uh, made some interventions at the end. But I think that was just a demonstration of, the, of his commitment to listen to the faith communities as he was moving forward in this pandemic. He then requested a memorandum of understanding to be established between Religions for Peace and, uh, and the World Health Organization, which is currently in process. Um, later on, WHO, this team, along with Religions for Peace and UNICEF, uh, we engaged in a series of, of webinars in the spring of 2021 uh, on com COVID-19 communications and advocacy, particularly around vaccine equity access and uptake. And all of those webinars are, uh, have, been video, have been video recorded and are available on YouTube. Uh, in November, uh, we then had worked together with this community of practice and we were able to then publish the World Health Organization strategy for engaging with religious leaders, faith-based organizations and faith communities in health emergencies. And as I say, this is a, a cause for uh, great happiness and rejoicing and for me also a cause of hope uh, because I think for many years the, um, the secular, scientific, diplomatic and, uh, and um, scientific community, the diplomatic community and the development community have had a very secularist agenda for the last, what, what would we say, several decades. Uh, and, I, and I think some of the more recent pandemics, HIV, uh, Ebola and now COVID, have helped some of those scientific colleagues to recognise that the secularist agenda, when it's very hard and it excludes faith perspectives, is not always helpful. Uh, and so for, for me, particularly having worked in this field in HIV for, for 30 years, to see the World Health Organization making formal steps to engage with faith-based organizations and listen uh, and learn and it be, enter into this kind of dialogue, for me, is a great source of hope. Because I think the more we talk to each other, the more we learn from one another, then the more effective our responses will be. And then late in 2021, uh, WHO, again, the team and uh, Religions for Peace work together with the communities of practice and from each of the communities of practice, people volunteered to be part of smaller working groups uh, to set up uh, this conference uh, on national responses to health emergencies. Um, WHO, religious leaders, faith based organizations, faith communities and national governments. And the conference had three tracks, again, reflecting the three communities of practice. And there were a whole series of webinars under each of those tracks where we had participants uh, from faith communities all over the world, from different faith backgrounds, uh, and also from ministries of health and from some of the technical colleagues, uh, where each panel was constructed around a particular subject within that theme. Uh, and the panel explored that subject. They've all been, uh, as I say, recorded and they're on, on the website. But again, that was a very important marker to be able to have um, the public sharing of so many of those experiences of faith partners working uh, in different countries, often in quite difficult conditions. Uh, and the next step will actually be to begin to try and document some of those case studies that were presented uh, in the webinars and look at ways to more formally publish those in academic, uh, uh, academic journals. Uh, next slide, please. So this, I'll run through these more quickly. So the WHO strategy for engaging religious leaders, faith-based organizations and faith communities in health emergencies, we just, we'll shorten that to faith partners, but that it includes all of those colleagues. The goal of the strategy is to enable more effective responses to health emergencies by strengthening that collaboration between WHO, national governments, religious leaders, 
faith-based organizations and faith communities. And that will result in more people being better protected from health emergencies, enjoying better health and well-being, and, in, and it includes improving trust and social cohesion. I think many of you who are from faith communities know that that long-standing presence of faith partners in communities through, uh, through pandemics, through tsunamis, through wars, has been a constant source of, of social cohesion and trust. And that, that's very important in times of crisis. So it's about collaboration. Next slide, please. The scope of the strategy, uh, so the, the link uh, provided in the final slide, but this, the strategy defines how WHO and the faith partners uh, can support national governments during health emergencies. And the, the intention is to support a national response. That national response is led by an elected government, where the government doesn't do everything. There are many partners in the country that contribute to that national response. And so this strategy will define how WHO and the, and the faith partners will contribute to strengthening of national government uh, leadership in that whole um, multi-sectoral national response to a pandemic. So the strategy outlines the different respective roles and responsibilities of WHO and the faith partners. It's a guidance note for secretariat staff at, at, at national, regional and country level uh, and global level. It's an advocacy tool because as we know, it's often been difficult to engage faith-based organizations in some of the more secular approaches to uh, disease management. And so it's an advocacy tool to, to articulate the case as to why it's important. It's a set of principles for both partners to abide by. Uh, and as Harvey said, I've worked in sexual reproductive health and rights for many years, and some of the issues in sexual and reproductive health are very sensitive to faith communities. And there have been examples of, of faith leaders undermining scientific evidence and there have been examples of scientific partners undermining religious beliefs, and that sets up a conflictual approach, which is not helpful. Uh, and so the, the principles that we want to work about, uh, work together around, include respecting one another's positions and looking for areas of common ground. And then it also includes a potential list, a list of potential areas for action, uh, and under those are, are activities that, that might be considered. Uh, obviously, what happens in each community will be different by the driven by the needs and, and the circumstances in that country. Um, but there's a, a, a sort of menu, if you like, from which uh, countries and partners can choose from based on their circumstances and also a set of uh, provisional indicators around which the work can be measured. Uh, the next slide, please. The principles, just to read these out for you, again, they're articulated in more detail in the strategy itself, but the headlines are to respect human rights, gender equality and inclusion. And again, that's very important. It's, it's important that uh, we involve all the partners. We also respect religious diversity uh, and, and we include people of different ages, different ethnic groups. That it's nationally led, it's not driven from outside. That we promote shared values. It's informed by data and we respect and, and we build in uh, religious differences and the perspectives of those with different perspectives from different religious traditions. That as far as possible, we're fully representative and that we are community centered and accountable, that the idea is to nurture trust, not undermine trust, not undermine credibility of one another, but build those partnerships and relationships through being open and transparent. The next one, please. So there's then a set of roles and responsibilities. And this, uh, much of this, this strategy has built on previous strategies that have been developed across the UN for engagement with faith partners. And these are similar uh, big buckets, if you like, to the uh, roles and responsibilities that we included in the uh, UN AIDS framework for engagement of faith-based partners in the HIV response. So uh, there's a, a set of roles and responsibilities for the World Health Organization uh, in terms of providing that, uh, the, that normative guidance and the scientific evidence. There's also a set of roles and responsibilities for religious leaders and faith-based communities in terms of interpreting that evidence in a way that matches the, the faith traditions and, and interpreting it in language that their faith communities can, uh, can resonate with and therefore adopt and trust. And then there's a set of roles and responsibilities that are collective that we will all abide by. Uh, next one, please. And the areas of focus. So again, we had uh, discussions around the sort of kinds of activities that we might want to do together. And there are six broad areas under which uh, actions and activities can take place. First of all, fostering and building partnerships, making sure that they're inclusive, 
building capacity and helping to build community resilience. And it's been very clear in this pandemic that where there's been a long-standing um, work from faith communities in building community resistance, for example, post a tsunami or after a, a conflict, looking out for one another in a community and learning who is at, who is at risk and who we need to go and identify uh, and help in, the, in an immediate emergency, that kind of resilience building can be very important in, uh, in the next pandemic. Uh, so we've seen that that, that kind of long term presence, particularly that infrastructure and social cohesion and that training that many of the faith communities have done in previous pandemics or crises has been really important. Communicating effectively and responding to the infodemic. That's a new word that's emerged with this pandemic, but really that deluge of information. Some of it's accurate, some of it's correct, some of it's complete rubbish uh, and some of it's politically slanted to 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 achieve a particular agenda. So part of our work has been to help work with faith communities to, to navigate that complicated minefield and, and, and come up with uh, an understanding of what is correct and for the faith leaders to then be able to take that correct information and share it with their communities. To protect freedom of religion and belief while minimizing the risk of disease transmission. Of course, that's been very important around the in Ebola and uh, in COVID, the need uh, to look at burial protocols and practices such that religious beliefs and traditions can be respected, whilst at the same time not, in, uh, not risking those who are performing the, the last rites to infection from an infectious disease, for example, or respecting that need to worship, uh, whilst also figuring out how uh, houses of worship may need to close temporarily to stop transmission uh, and when it's safe to open and negotiating those things with faith leaders. Advancing a more equitable society and much of the faith community's work in many years has been to champion the needs of the poor and marginalised and the vulnerable. So working together with civil society and faith based groups to provide them with the accurate information so that they can go and target uh, accurate advocacy and call for things uh, that really need to change and shift. Uh, in a way that perhaps the UN uh, can't do. So again, it's partnering to enable people who've got a voice as a religious leader or as a group of religious leaders and communities to make, make a message very clear. Advancing a more equitable society and providing social, practical and economic support to families and communities adversely affected by the health emergency. One of the tracks from the conference was looking at when houses of worship closed, how different faith communities all over the world transformed their houses of worship into different things. They offered them, for example, to the government as a vaccination center or a treatment center or a place of refuge for, uh, for people who, have, who were homeless or a feeding center. Uh, and also how they then, uh, many of them also provided food for people in lockdown who couldn't access food or provided food for key workers or hospital workers. Uh, and then finally, number six, providing direct health services to communities. And we know in many countries that the faith community run and manage not only um, tertiary institutions, but also uh, secondary and pri much primary health care. And through that complicated infrastructure, very important infrastructure, the health partners have been able to support government in controlling the pandemic in many places. So these are the big areas uh, around which the strategy has focused and helps to articulate activities that could take place in future uh, pandemics or emergencies. Next one, please. Oh, that's it. So I'll, I'll stop there and uh, hand back to Harvey and would be happy to uh, take any questions, but maybe those will come at the end when other colleagues have presented. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sadiq. That was really helpful. Yes, you're right. I think we better keep the question for the end, but I encourage participants to write their questions down either keep them on paper or put them on the chat uh, forum on, on, on Zoom. And after everybody has presented, um, we will have time for Q&A. So in the interest of time, I, I, I move on to invite Dr. Mai Makoka to make his presentation. Uh, Dr. Mai Makoka is a friend. We grew up together in Malawi, and I'm so excited to read his bio. Um, we, we, we were together in, in, in Yun in Malawi back in the 90s and to see how he has progressed to become the person that he has become now is just an exciting blessing for, for all of us. He is the program executive for health and healing at the World Council of Churches in Geneva since 2016. He received medical training from the University of Malawi in 2002 and postdoctoral training in medical and public health microbiology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the USA in 2007. 
Besides clinical work, he has taught at the University of Malawi School of Medicine and worked in the National HIV Program. He, he was previously head of the Christian Health Association of Malawi and a many network of church health facilities and training schools. In his current role at the WCC, Dr. Mai Makoka um, works with WCC members to support their hospitals, congregational best health, health promotion programs, as well as national and international Christian health networks. He has published several scientific paper, papers in peer reviewed journal, uh, and recently he published Health Promoting Churches, Volumes 1 and 2. Dr. Makoka serves as the WCC liaison with the World Health Organization and other international health organizations and serves on boards of the Ecumenical Pharmaceutical Network, EPN, Africa Christian Health Associations Platform, and Christian Connections for International Health, and on several other WHO working groups. My welcome, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harvey uh, and Sally, for laying a very good foundation. I will uh, make, uh, I think, uh, few remarks. I did not prepare a PowerPoint, um, but I will add on and build on what uh, my, my friend Sally has, has mentioned because I was involved in several of those uh, initiatives uh, that she has referred to, the guidelines which we worked on just after uh, Ebola, I mean, COVID broke out. And we sort of tried to give a guide and uh, some notes for faith communities on how to respond, especially in areas of uh, places of worship uh, and all that. Uh, but way back, the World Council of Churches actually has been keen and engaged on health since its establishment in 1948. And along the way, uh, WC came up with a, a definition of health, which was more like a dictionary definition. Says health is a dynamic state of well-being of the individual and society, both physical, mental, spiritual, economic, political, and social well-being, of being in harmony with each other, with the material world, and with God. Uh, but several years later, uh, they came up with a uh, uh, they had a long uh, series of regional consultations on the church's role, on health, understanding health, wholeness, and healing, and then. They came up with a, a series of what I, what I call operational definitions. So it's okay. Health is a justice issue, and health is a peace issue. Okay. Health has to do with integrity of creation. Health is a spiritual issue. Health is a personal issue. <laughs> and also health is a community issue. And health is also a systemic issue. So when you look at these, actually, it leads us to say, okay, we need to have a holistic approach to health. And so when we are looking at health challenges, pandemics and all that, we have to look at also the root causes. And even in curative services or all that, then we are not looking at treating diseases, but treating people, and not only the index case, but treating families and communities where people are in. So a very holistic approach to health. And I think when looking at uh, uh, outbreaks and pandemics and all that, this is extremely important because as we have seen with the, um, uh, the current pandemic, it's not, it may be a medical problem in its origin, but it has far-reaching uh, ramifications, which means a purely medical approach to health is not adequate. And as health workers, we need to create space, co-opt, and bring in as many multi-sectoral actors as possible. As Harvey was introducing me, he said, okay, he's a program executive for health and healing at World Council of Churches. And this always, uh, the naming of the program always raises questions, why health and healing instead of just health? Uh, because we look at healing 
is different from cure. Sometimes cure can take place without healing. And sometimes healing can take place without cure. So where cure is really interested in alleviation of symptoms. And sometimes healing, I mean, cure is not possible. Building on our, our, on our Christian identity, there are two stories I, I think aptly uh, convey the distinction. There is a story about the miracle which Jesus Christ performed healing a woman who had an issue of blood uh, for 12 years. And she said, okay, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. So she had faith. And then the story goes that she touched the hem of the garment of Jesus and the healing, I mean, and the, the blood instantly stopped and Jesus noticed. And then he turned around and said, oh, who touched me? And we have a conversation. The disciples say, oh, no, master, there are all these people. Why, how can you ask who touched you? It's the multitude. And the woman came forward and said, oh, it is me. And then there's uh, some conversation there uh, where the Bible says she told him everything. And at the end of the conversation, Jesus said, okay, you have been healed, go in peace. So even though we can say when the blood stopped, she had been cured, but she had not been healed. So healing really, uh, the diseases touch many aspects of human life and we need time and space for healing also to touch the rest of the areas of life which have been uh, affected. And so this really uh, amplifies the requirement for holistic healing. And there's another story of Paul, uh, which says, oh, he had a thorn in the flesh, some chronic pain he struggled with. And he says he prayed many times for the pain to go away. And every time he prayed, uh, God told him, my grace is sufficient for you. And they pain did not go away, but he was healed. He was not cured, but he was able to lead a successful life, Christian life and all on. And he went going on with his work, even though he had some disease that he was not able to find cure. So early in the, uh, in the pandemic of HIV, of the epidemic of HIV, we saw that even before antiretroviral medicines were discovered and available on the market, there was no known treatment. But faith and especially Christian communities were in the forefront providing care, providing hope. So this is where actually the issue of faith and hope comes in a very good relief that even where cure is not possible, there is still something that faiths Christians can do on this stage. And the other point I just want to highlight is uh, faith-based versus uh, faith-placed. Okay, so the faith engagement on health matters, we can look at it from two levels of complexity, faith-based versus faith-placed. So faith-placed, I think we can just say when public health programs, public health or health activities are taking place within a faith community, within a faith setting, then we say, okay, it's faith placed. They have not been, there has not been what I can call <laughs> value addition. There's been not been a, a, a faith value addition. The faith has not injected any additional value there. So it's just basic uh, health activities, only that they happen to take place in a faith setting. Maybe it's the venue, uh, uh, so that would be say it's a faith uh, placed. But we are looking at deeper engagement where there's more uh, theological um, understanding of why are we doing this? Why do churches do health? Why are we involved? So that now the health activities are based on the understanding, the self-understanding of the particular faith. So now it's faith-based. The same issues have been embellished, have been enriched. There has been a value addition, a deeper understanding. So then we're looking at faith-based. 
faith-based. And I think that's uh, very important, especially in difficult um, challenges we are facing now, which has much deeper and much serious considerations, even cost. And so health for, uh, for churches is really, we look at it as part of mission. It's, it's not simply one of the pathways to development. So the sustainable development goals really uh, uh, highlight health as a very important component for sustainable development and is a big part of the human development index. So faith, I mean, health has an instrumental value. It is part of the pathway. It helps communities to have, uh, to be productive, to live economically productive lives, to be productive members of the society and to contribute to the economy of the countries. So even organizations in the private sector are, are, are challenged to invest in the health of their employees, to invest in the health of their communities. That's why we raise our issues of a corporate social responsibility. If people are healthy, they can buy your products. They can, can, they can work and have an income. With that income, they can come back and buy your products. So health has instrumental value. But health as mission, we say health is intrinsic, has intrinsic value. And so Jesus sent his disciples, go preach, teach, and heal. So this helps us look better and also um, concentrate more on the holistic healing so that we are not only looking at health as something which is going to, to help us achieve, but health by its own has, is part of our mission. It is not an add-on. So when churches are doing health, when they are taking on health promotion activities, when they are sort of going out of their way to promote health, that is not additional, it's part of mission. And I think the, the, the readiness in which we saw many uh, churches opening up spaces to provide COVID uh, support, to provide vaccinations, and many are actually doing this, is because of that faith-based understanding. And it is not universal. And we continue to challenge and promote and facilitate as many churches, as many church leaders, as many Christians to have this understanding and to promote it in their own way so that we are all agents of health. Uh, so you refer to the health promoting churches I just finish up with that. That is actually has four main pillars. One is that churches should be centers of health education. And this is very central to uh, the document how can uh, faith communities contribute to pandemic preparedness, pandemic management, and combating misinformation is because uh, I mean, faith communities and faith uh, settings can be places of credible health messaging and also credible and effective health activities. So doing things, acting together, and also advocacy. And the fourth one is actually being, being witnesses to, uh, to the healing and to the life-giving nature of our faith. So those four, uh, health education, practical actions, advocacy, and public witness are very central. And I think uh, uh, we have ample evidence that actually churches and other faith communities can be and should be credible actors on health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mwai, uh, for the presentation and for keeping time. Uh, really appreciate everything you said. Now we have our third presenter today, and, and it's Dr. Ben Walker. Dr. Ben Walker is the Strategic Program Manager for the Diocese of Leeds in the Church of England. Previously, he was Associate Team Leader for the Diocese of York, running a project focused on mission and younger adults. He completed his PhD in the WHO Collaborating Center at the University of York, the Center for Global Health Histories, after which he spent a year as a teaching fellow in the history department. He read African studies at Peterhouse, Cambridge, and history at Gonville and Caius College, Cambridge. He has a book coming out in less than two weeks. That's exciting. 
entitled Religion in Global Health and Development, the case of 20th century, 20th century Ghana, published by McGill Queens University Press. It's, um, it's available through Black Force, Lehman's, Amazon, Walmart, Barnes & Noble, and other book retailers. Ben, looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much, Harvey. Um, yes, yeah, so I take a historical approach to this, but I think one that has a lot of contemporary relevance. So if we're talking in the subject of hope, for me, hope is partly about imagination. So while I think um, history gives us probably one of the most powerful, uh, one of the most um, useful expl explanatory frameworks we have for understanding our world, history also doesn't just offer that. It also allows us to expand our imaginative framework because it introduces us to unexpected possibilities, whether we're looking at the Middle Ages or the 16th century or 20th century Ghana, which is what my um, book was on, as Harvey just mentioned. We are, we're looking at the ways in which, um, aside from the, the narratives that we're used to, how did things happen in ways that maybe we don't understand fully yet, or maybe have been lost or neglected or pushed aside because they don't suit a particular narrative or suit particularly powerful individuals. And I think um, that's what we can do when we look at faith and health, faith-based organizations and global health, is where we step aside from the control of particularly powerful organization, uh, organization or uh, governmental stories about what health and faith is, we can see much more interesting things and that opens up our imagination it opens up our possibility for health and i guess that's what my book was trying to do um so it is uh it is now available it's called religion in global health and development the case for 20th century ghana um, and what i'm doing is i guess the big concern that drives my work is how religion and global health relate to one another and and i guess as a historian, I'm trying to, I try to answer this question by looking at how the legacies from the last century shape current interactions between religion and global health in this one. So how our, imagine, our imagination might have got limited to what we can understand or remember of the past. And my hope is to bring that open a little bit more to think about, well, where are, where are the things that we have lost sight of? And how does that help us to think about what global health could be? And what kind of people is it not being helping that could be helped more? Um, so structural injustices, colonial geographies of extraction, exploitation, patterns of labour, specific streams of development funding, and even particular individuals all last a really long time in global health and development. And when we approach the hardest and most intractable questions of politics and economics, interrogating history also provides a vital route to effective solutions. Because what we do is we dig into uh, digging deep into particular contexts in which historical connections between religion, development, faith, and global health actually matter in very specific and again, maybe surprising ways. And so that's what the book is about. I did that particularly on Ghana in, in order to tell a story about how global health and religion have interacted, understood one another, where there have been limits in that relation, where there have been legacies in it, where things have had lasting effects for us today. And there are a few things that come out of it, and I won't go through all of them, you'll have to get the book, um, but there are a few things that I think are particularly relevant, re particularly relevant for what Sally and Y have just been sharing. One of the things that Sally said is about how sometimes there's been a secularist hold on global health. I think given that 84% of the world's population identify with one of the world's major religions, that's extraordinary that that's happened. But I don't just think it's about secularism. I also think it's about Eurocentricism. I think it's about a way that we've misunderstood how states operate outside of Europe. Um, so Elizabeth Clemens has done some uh, really interesting work on how um, public and private connections have fit together. Um, within the US. And she talks about how there's been a picture of the European state, which is one in which she says it's centralized, bureaucratic, autonomous public authorities that create governance. And she says, for her, that just doesn't fit for the US because actually public institutions and private organizations are kind of in a, a linked symbiotically. 
And I took that and I thought it was a really interesting way of challenging the hold of that Eurocentric narrative of what the state should be, what government should be, and how development should work. And I think it really applies to Ghana, but in different ways. So for Ghana, there's been national governments has had religion organized in a voluntary sector since its or architects in the 20, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and then extended well beyond that. It didn't disappear. Um, and actually, we might think of that as, um, as I guess, when you, if you were expecting a European-style state, you might think of that as a weakness, that, at, that there is a voluntary sector that is maybe disconnected from certain kinds of democracy or certain kinds of accountability. But there are actually massive benefits to its infrastructural power because what it offers is a rich collaboration between donors and beneficiaries, uh, where, where it's based on contribution rather than consent for solidarity. So I think in Ghana, when you, when you look at the state, what you find is again, not a picture of a European state. What you find is a state in which faith-based organizations have been actively creating healthcare and often significant parts of healthcare for decades. So today, um, I think the last assessment was that 42% of the national infrastructure of health is run by faith-based organizations. And, and that's been going on for a very long time. In the 20s and 30s, the beginning of some of the formation of this, the government in, um, in the Gold Coast, as it was before Ghana became independent in 1957, tried to give all of maternal and child health to faith-based organizations, to medical missions, because they thought that that was the way to structure the state, because the state didn't emerge over centuries in quite the same way uh, that you might imagine European states. It emerged in different periods of, yes, stretching out the look at like kind of pre-colonial state um, development, but also in very quick, very contracted, very uh, intense um, forms over perhaps nine or 10 years in the 20s where they were creating healthcare and education very quickly. And these things lasted and they still matter. It's not only Ghana that has 42% of its health infrastructure, which is run by faith-based organizations. I think the uh, last work I saw suggested that Uganda was 50%, I think Kenya was 40%. Um, uh, the WHO in a recent, I'm just getting the stat up, um, it was in, yeah, in the, when the WHO organizational, um, I don't know, it was in a UN AIDS um, strategic um, partnership with faith-based organizations framework, they said that um, the WHO estimated that faith-based groups provide between 30 and 70% of all healthcare in Africa. In some areas, faith-based hospitals or clinics are the only healthcare facilities that exist. And faith-based organizations are a major source of, for example, as I said, AIDS funding, particularly in the least developed countries. And this didn't come out of nowhere. This has been a long-term development. And I think for some reason, our imagination and our hope has contracted so that we can't quite see this maybe like we used to. Um, and historical approaches open up that, and that's partly what the book's doing, is to show us where those neglected actors have been deeply involved in creating health and um, health infrastructure. And I'll, I'll end with um, just uh, this point, that when we lose that um, um, uh, imaginative memory, we lose why global health campaigns worked in the first place. So one of my chapters in the book is about smallpox eradication. Without faith-based organizations, without faith actors, smallpox eradication probably wouldn't have been possible because actually it was originally faith actors that knocked on the door of, um, of USAID, uh, USAID in Ghana particularly, and forced it to happen. They knocked on the door and in order to get the program going before there was any interest in it. And it was through, uh, you can look at people like uh, Will, um, Bill Fagy's uh, work, uh, he uh, did North biographical work, um, I think it's called House on, on, I think it's House on Fire, um, where he was talking about being a smallpox warrior. And he said it was through missionary networks, through uh, missionary phone networks, especially they were able to track the disease local teams of, um, of workers were the ones that actually made smallpox eradication and control happen. So when we look at Go Global Health's greatest triumphs, like smallpox eradication being one of the ones that gets um, rolled out consistently as, as where global health can work at its best, if we don't see where faith and health and hope are interacting, we won't fully be able to understand why it happened. If we don't know why it happened, we won't be able to know why it can happen again. 
when we're looking at COVID and we're looking at vaccine hesitancy, when looking, like Sally mentioned, at primary health care, in order to fully understand how these become, um, how, well, how we make effective solutions in these areas, we have to understand the history of how faith and faith-based organisations have been creating health, often with visions, sometimes competing visions of what that hope is, but often in very significant ways, especially in local communities. So I'll end there. Um, like I said, you know, if you if you want to hear more, there's obviously the book that you can buy, only £26 on Blackwells and, and other places. I'll put the link in the chat later. But I think that gives you a picture of how I think history can be really helpful in unpacking new and imaginative solutions for global health. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, that was again powerful and um, delighted that um, all the speakers have kept time. So we have a good 30 minutes for question and answer session. Um, let me open it up to everybody. Um, I think we've been collecting our questions as, as we've been listening to the speakers. Um, may I invite you to bring your questions forward so we can interact with, with the speakers? Thank you. Avi, perhaps while we're waiting um, for questions, um, there was one thing that sparked uh, my interest from uh, Sally's talk, which is uh, in, in which she explained the WHO strategy for engaging faith partners. And, and one of the things that I that I um, that has been an important part of that is the is the second line in the strategy says that throughout history, religious leaders, faith based organisations, and faith communities have played a role in health emergencies, providing frontline medical services and humanitarian assistance as well as communicating, communicating helpful information, promoting health saving practices, preventing and reducing fear and stigma, and providing reassurance to people in communities. Um, and I think this strategy, you know, one of my reflections is that it's a really important moment. Uh, there's, there's something captured in it that's really special, that actually I think really opens up our imagination for what's going to be possible with how we address future epidemics and pandemics, but also how we address long-term infrastructural health weaknesses. You know, it's not um, it's not only emergencies that are that are places where health where faith partners are really important. I was recently speaking to um, head of a uh, one of the heads of uh, Lusaka Hospital, and she was talking about how maternal and child health needs to be put back on the agenda as a key problem um, for addressing. And I think again, when we look at faith actors over the long term, exactly what it said in that strategy, they've been working in maternal and child health for, if not a century but may significantly more. And I think one of the things that I think is um, important for us to remember in this is that um, there are lots of ways in which faith um, partners can be engaged. Um, and actually some of those drawn out of the past are gonna help us to figure out ways that they can be engaged in new ways for the future. Um, I just thought I'd say that whilst we're waiting for any more questions. And perhaps um, Sally or Mai might have questions as well. We could chat about those. Okay, so just, just for those of you who are not aware of the WHO's process, uh, the governing board body of, of the World Health Organization is made up of the member states and there's generally the representatives who sit on that governing board are the Ministers of Health. Um, and so they would have an agenda like any other organization in the governing body. Uh, and they, uh, one, of the, one of the agenda items some years ago was to negotiate this framework for engagement of non-state actors with WHO. So WHO is a member state organization. Uh, it, is, it is set up to, to, to draw up the norms and standards on, on medicine to advise countries. And so it's the ministers of health who draw up the, the policy in, in that board. So the framework for non-state actors was, uh, was agreed through that and is now an official document of the WHO. And it has under it uh, the opportunity for different partners to become um, non-state members um, in a, uh, non state organizations in official relations with WHO. And that gives those non state actors certain privileges. For example, they can speak uh, and make an intervention at the World Health Assembly. So they can come together in groups, for example, faith based organizations or sit people living with HIV or, uh, or other constituencies. If there's an agenda item on the agenda that is of interest to them, perhaps women's health, women's groups may want to come together. Um, and they can make an intervention in the World Health Assembly on that agenda item and suggest uh, their, their contributions to what member states might wish to consider in pulling that, 
that agenda item declaration together. Um, to become a, uh, an NGO in uh, official relations takes several years. You have to uh, put in all your documentation and then you apply. And also you have to work then on, an, on a, uh, a collaborative, an informal collaborative partnership for two or three years to demonstrate that you've been engaging. Uh, and so what we've done in this strategy uh, and then in creating a network is provide an opportunity for faith-based groups who would like to become um, NGOs or faith-based groups in, in official relations with WHO to start that process and to work with us on a more informal basis over two years so that they've got that documented portfolio of collaboration in a couple of years that they will then be able to submit and be uh, a part of that. Uh, a part of that more official um, process. And in addition, this um, uh, document that we've prepared, the strategy and the, 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 the strategy for engagement of faith-based groups will sit as an annex under the civil society strategy, which is under development at the moment. And that will be a civil society strategy that will inform the framework for engagement of non-state actors. So it's got that this strategy will have a formal home within that formal architecture. Uh, and I think for me, uh, and, and I was chatting with my about this yesterday, this is a great source of hope um, because previously there hasn't been uh, a formal opportunity for faith-based groups to do that. You could become, in a mem uh, you could become uh, an NGO in, in official relations, but there was no collaborating mechanism to do that together. Uh, and I think this is an important step forward and an important recognition of the role that faith-based organizations play. So I'll stop there, but I hope that was what, was helpful. Sorry, it's a bit, I'm a bit garbled, but I'm trying to. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sorry. Um, Sorry, I was just going to pitch in there um, and I was going to say, um, one, not garbled at all, so really, really helpful and really interesting. Um, I think one, one of the, um, I've just uh, spotted that we, um, some um, Alice has also, or Alison has also asked about um, the, the, uh, the discussion being really focused on uh, in uh, um, on maybe um, Christianity and and I think uh, just one of the comments is that there was a previous event focused on Buddhism in Asia and more into faith discussions are planned um, and um, but also partly I'd just add in my own work that um, there is this part of my um, third chapter um, sorry my second chapter especially looks at how um, Muslim actors and Christian actors in government related to one each other in the context of decolonization. Um, so when you actually hone in on what's happening on the ground, again, they don't fit, it doesn't fit into simple categories. Um, actually, there's a lot, there is a lot of interfaith work that maybe isn't always visible to, um, to at higher levels. Um, and sometimes that's because different actors actually in the in the context of a difficult situation have to work together. And that, ha that happens a lot ecumenically as well. You know, we don't, Christianity is not um, homogenous. It's extremely heterogeneous and there's lots of different kinds of um, uh, Christian faith that actors uh, working and having had worked over the last um, 100 years or more. Um, but you often find within the, uh, the health field where, where there are uh, urgent problems or infrastructural lack or um, even just um, health, uh, consistent health issues that haven't been addressed, often maybe um, conflicts that are happening in other places don't get replicated because of need. And so I think it was in the 1920s, I think it's in Shane Dole's work where he talks about in Uganda how um, maternal and child health in Uganda in the 20s and 30s was, the same, was around the same level as it was in England and Wales at the time because Catholic and Protestant um, actors were working together. And that was a big jump, but in the context of the need, it got, um, it got squashed. And so actually there, it became a lot more ability to create health infrastructure. But that's just uh, what that, there'd be many more things we could talk about there, but I think there are other um, uh, discussions for that planned. Thank you, Ben. In Rajit, I saw your hand up. Um, it disappeared now, but just to have your question. You know, hello. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for that um, uh, for your presentations. I think what I was uh, sort of really thinking about is, and you did allude to this in your in your uh, conversations, um, the way in which uh, religion or religious ideas can be appropriated towards all sorts of, uh, you know, mischievous ends, if you will, to put it, uh, you know, cutely. Um, and what have been your struggles, uh, I guess, in your work, you know, to 
to sort of balance out against those ends and to push for uh, these sorts of humanitarian, if you will, or humanistic, if you will, uh, ends uh, to, to, to which you know, faith can be uh, placed. So I, I completely understand the, uh, the, the blanket secularist, uh, if you will, suspicion of, of religion, which I don't agree with, but I understand where that comes from. Uh, but there is the other sort of aspect of appropriation of, uh, of, of faith. Uh, and I wondered, you know, what would be the best ways to push back against those from a faith-oriented uh, narrative or faith-oriented politics? Mm. Okay, who goes first? I can try to start. <laughs> it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a very pertinent uh, question you have raised, and uh, we don't save ourselves well by painting it all nice and rosy, uh, but we have to be realistic on the issues on the ground. I think firstly, Sally mentioned about the, the heterogeneity that even within a particular Christian denomination, there's no homogeneity. There's a whole, uh, there's a whole spectrum. Uh, so if you say Anglicans or Catholics or, or Baptist, it's not one Baptist, not one Protestant. So that appreciation is very important, um, especially if we are looking at the interface between faith communities and governments, that the government or the, the state actors must not conclude that, oh, because this particular church is saying no to vaccines, then all of them don't like vaccines. Therefore, let's not work with them because they are throwing spanners. <laughs> Just like also faith communities must not paint the governments in, 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 uh, uh, as if they are homogeneous. There's a huge value. Even within a particular government, you have some ministers that are like, leaning this way and uh, some are open to working with faith communities, others are not. And one minister of health leaves, another one comes, he says, no, we don't like working with, uh, with church hospitals. We gave you this ambulance, so we, they withdraw the ambulances, they withdraw everything. <laughs> Why are we giving ambulances to church hospitals? You are promoting your own church. You're not, okay, you buy your own ambulances. As another one comes, they will be inviting doctors from church hospitals to training workshops and bringing them uh, on board. Say, no, we are saving the same population. Uh, we are saving the same people. So uh, we have to be sensitive to those. In very general terms, we see that actually when HIV started, there was a lot of misunderstandings. Sometimes issues arise which challenge our theology. The way we understand ourselves, the way we understand our scriptures, the way we understand God. So like HIV in the beginning, mostly, okay, this is a punishment from God. And there was a stigma and a discrimination. And then there has been time of learning and reshaping and changing until now this more understanding that this does not mean you it, you are being punished so this is not a punishment from god of course others are still hanging on to those to those narratives um, but there is so what i'm saying is we need to understand that sometimes we need time for new understandings to develop and to take root and that period, we need we need empathy. We need to be uh, we need to yeah we need to be empathetic with one another. We need patience that these big changes cannot happen overnight. And when uh, faith communities, when churches are going through this change, it's not the time to throw them under the bus. It is time to engage with them, to give them more information, to invite them to round table discussions, you know, to bring them on board. You don't make peace with your friend. You make peace with your enemy. You make peace with those whom, whom you don't see eye to eye. They are the ones to invite on the table. They are not the ones you delete their email addresses. You bring them on board. Don't say, oh, this one said, uh, bring them on board. Look for common ground and build from common ground. I think uh, those are think some of the issues which I, I think would help in navigating these kind of complexities. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And uh, thanks very much for the question and, and to Mai for those reflections. Thanks, Indrajit. I think uh, I have two, I have uh, multiple concurrent thoughts, shall we say. <laughs> but I have two strands of, of thinking that I'd like to sort of in, uh, inject into the conversation, if you like. I think. Um, I, I think some of you will know that my PhD was looking at a critical discourse analysis of the nego um, negotiations towards and the final text of the political declarations on HIV and AIDS that took four of, uh, I, I analyzed, analyzed four of them that took place over 20 years, 15, 20 years. And what was very common uh, in analyzing the final text of those documents was that certain important elements of public health were omitted from the, the language. And uh, I was also working within the team of civil society organizations, so working with the networks of sex workers, drug users, gay men, people living with HIV, youth, women, etc., as well as the faith community. And, and the scientific community uh, were, were very upset at the final documentation, uh, the final declarations that came out when, when key words were missing. And it was clear from the negotiation process, which, as I mentioned before, is a, is a member state negotiation process that there were certain countries that were unhappy and uncomfortable with certain words, and that certain words became, if you like, code words for sexual behaviours that they were uncomfortable with. Um, and so they got removed from the text. And the, 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 the consequence of that is that, that a political declaration is, is something higher level than, than is something that is approved at the, the World Health Assembly in, in Geneva. You have the ministers of health who negotiate uh, the agenda items at the World Health Assembly in Geneva. Similarly, uh, the UN AIDS board was generally made up of ministers of health and, and the agenda items and the documents that came out of the UN AIDS board were, were negotiated at government level, but by the ministers of health. When it took, when you had a political declaration on something like AIDS, or so we've subsequently had others, it gets elevated to the UN in New York. And uh, it's, it's negotiated by the, generally by the staff in New York uh, embassies and it's finalized and the, member, the heads of state are often brought in to ratify that. The importance of the text is that, that that text should then form a blueprint for the AIDS plan at a national level for the Ministry of Health. And if you, if you are omitting words like um, drug use or sex work, because we don't want to talk about those things, then that enables a, a government of a certain political leaning or religious leading not to have a robust uh, program to address the needs of sex workers or drug users, for example. And so there was a constant frustration as, because the, the text that was uh, originally developed for these documents is generally developed uh, in collaboration with the, the technical agencies, WHO and UNAIDS, and includes all of that language. And those bits get excluded. Um, and so my PhD was looking at why and how they got excluded. And what came about at the end was very, very interesting that there is this hard secularist discourse within uh, diplomacy, democracy, public health, et cetera. And the countries that support a, a hard secularist discourse, that generally the, um, the thinking is that we don't bring any religion into the public health debate or into the diplomatic process. Religion should be kept out altogether from that field. It is a secular place in which we are discussing secular issues and religion has no place here. That's the secularist Hard, secu hard secularist position. And I should say, in explaining this, within religion, you have a rainbow spectrum of opinion and people at the polar ends of that rainbow spectrum. Within politics and diplomacy and public health, you have a rainbow spectrum of opinion with people at those polarized ends. But the more we caricature people into one polarized corner, the, the more difficult it is to negotiate text in the middle. And it's often around that middle ground that we need some give and take in order to then have meaningful policy that will then be, enable us to make meaningful pro projects at country level. And so what, what came out of the analysis was that there were a number of member states that did not separate out faith from state. And those member states are quite happy to bring religious discourse to the table. Uh, and when one looks at those member states, the, the dominant religion that is informing that, that discourse tends to be on the more conservative side, if not the very conservative side of religious perspective. There is a rainbow spectrum of, of, of religious perspective, but the secularist states will not allow any religious discourse in the room. And so 
they will not speak a religious answer to a religious question that's being brought by another member state. And they often, the diplomats, don't actually have any understanding themselves of religion and, and, and aren't able to bring a religious answer to what's essentially a religious question. And so you only get one presentation of the religious discourse in the room. You don't get the rainbow spectrum. You get a religious discourse, which is primarily conservative, arguing with a political and public health discourse, which is primarily secular. And the result is that some of the more sensitive things get removed. And so my, my, that surprised me. I hadn't, I hadn't understood that it was that secularist approach, which was actually contributing to the lack of public health uh, language in those declarations. But my conclusion was therefore to say that the answer is not to remove all religious discourse from the negotiations, because the more you bend over backwards to remove it all, uh, you actually make the space bigger for those that are in the room. And the answer in a, in a diplomatic, uh, environment is that we allow the rainbow spectrum of political, social, religious, any discourse should be in the room, and that we negotiate together to, an, to a compromised agreement that we can all come up with. But by excluding, structurally excluding the uh, a more progressive and liberal religious discourse on sex and sexuality, you have skewed the text as a result. Uh, so that I thought was a very interesting finding. And so it goes back to your question, Indrajit. I think some uh, there are also some member states who will hijack a religious agenda to suit their political agenda. There are also religious communities that will hijack a political agenda to suit their religious agenda. And I, I said on a previous call yesterday, it's no good saying these are the good guys and these are the bad guys. That doesn't help. But it's about, uh, and, and I, th I think it's, and, and I know within many of the religious traditions, there's been a lot of work around these difficult issues of sex and sexuality and to try and wrestle with with the theology, but not just Christian theology, Islamic theology and, and, and other traditions, the Buddhists, the Hindus and others have tried to wrestle with these different issues and come to a place where they can work effectively in that space. But those voices are missing from the, the political discourse that sets the policy. So I think I, I would just say my, my answer was to, was to brief, to, to host some briefings with member states to explain this anomaly to them and invite uh, more uh, of, a, of a rainbow spectrum of religious discourse on different issues into that, perhaps not the negotiating space, but perhaps some of the pre-meetings that would inform the negotiations to have some briefings so that you could depolarize that conflict and, and help people to come out of corners and enable them to have a more meaningful dialogue in the middle. So that was a very long answer, but I hope that was helpful because for me, that's where the hope lies. Ben? Yeah, I think that's great, and um, and uh, and thank you as well for why what you were saying before that too. It, um, one of the things that I, I wonder if part of the reason that framework has been so limited is because again the way, and and this is you know of course it's you know, like the historical approach I think says a lot to this, but I think I think it's, there's a, and there's probably quite a lot of different ways it could, but just one that comes to mind is how um because the United Nations model is one of kind of modern states rather than imperial or regional subdivisions and um, what that does to our perspective from the present is it goes it, it turns we turn towards the past and we can only see the frameworks that we're using now and we lose sight of those frameworks that actually cut across national loyalties or the loyalties of member states that are actually potentially much older some of which have disappeared but some of which do have still have present validity and we can sign those kind of transnational structures to an age before independence an age before the 50s and 60s um, and it means that we lose sight of the complexity of the way people think but also the way that especially faith-based actors are acting across national borders um, and so I, it just yeah I think it's just it really interests me especially how when we think about kind of global health governance and the you know the creation of those borders but also how those borders get instilled the more we um the more that we act within global community i think maybe it, it's um also one of the ways to create a kind of maybe more um expansive dialogue is to bring back some of that complexity that goes beyond uh, our more simple structures of how nations how we think they're supposed to operate you know it, when we when you go to ask for certain things from from particular states 
they can't always deliver them and often that's because they weren't set up to deliver them they're, they're often they're set up in ways that expect faith or external actors to deliver them and so when we when we demand certain kinds of things of states we again we're missing that those transnational um, networks have actually formed a lot of our um, global governance and global community. Um, I think there's more I could say there, but I just think it's such an interesting point you make, Sally, about how um, how certain kinds of language get lost because of the way that um, only certain kinds of uh, groups are able to have that dialogue. Um, but I, and I just wonder if it's Again, it comes back to me, it's not all, all, only a secular thing. I think it's also a Eurocentric thing. Thank you, Ben. Um, my, Thank have you, you that was really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. My, Thank you. you. Go ahead. Yes, I just want to speak because I don't see any more questions coming in. Do you have some more questions? Mm, no. Uh, there was a question about the involvement of other fields that's been answered okay. and, uh, and somebody just went, you can go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to uh, to say that actually finding common ground is very important. Uh, finding common ground, it means we, in terms of uh, faith actors and state actors, you cannot agree on everything. But when you don't agree on everything, it doesn't mean you can't agree, you, 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 you can agree on nothing. <laughs> so you have, uh, you don't see, you don't agree on one thing. Doesn't mean that you have to disagree on everything else. So it is that common ground which we must not throw away. Uh, and health is very important. Um, and there's always change. So now even on our side, we're looking at faith healing. So we have movement there. Okay, we pray for you. If you have adequate faith, throw away your medicines as a demonstration of your faith. There we are going to disagree with those who uh, want complete adherence. But we, we can't agree. We can't agree on nothing. There has to be some way we can negotiate and find a place we can work together. And then we build on that. Uh, and there is always, we have to be vigilant because things are changing, the situation is evolving. Uh, and our institutions, our structures must also agree uh, to the current realities. But most importantly, we need structures, frameworks that are taking us into the future, not taking us to the past. So this kind of structures, even at the government level, at organizational level, we need that kind of flexibility uh, and willingness to respond to reality and to move uh, into the future, not into the past. Um, so I think we, we need to be open, we need to be flexible, and we need to be willing to always have this multi-sectoral collaboration uh, especially health is very is very important and as we are discussing this in the backdrop of the pandemic it has shown us that no one can do it alone firstly secondly you cannot be detached it will affect you in one way or another and everyone has something to contribute you may be the mighty medical doctor you have all the tools in your hospital that people may not come because someone you don't even think is of relevance is discouraging people to come to, your, to, to, to receive your services. Or you can actually be registering a lot of success uh, and you may try to take all the credit only to find out that actually there are some people in the community that are helping to spread good information to promote trust in the medical facilities, in the health sciences and all that. Uh, so it's, it's very important actually to look for common ground and build on common ground and not build on differences. We have all spoken about the connection between mission in, in one way or another and, and health. Um, examples from Ghana, my, you're aware of this from Malawi, 
um, Sam would be for survey. In, in, in this era of world Christianity now, where a mission is no longer just the West going to the rest, a mission is no longer just Eurocentric or West, Western centered, it's, it's, it's Christians moving from one place to another. What, what aspects of, of this new reality give us hope that can actually begin to speak into the health conversations in, in ways that open up the health uh, wisdom that's are available around the world in indigenous communities that are now mixing uh, together in the context of current migration patterns? Would, would somebody have something to say on that? I can just say about our actually issue of decolonization and uh, where in the theology terms, they're also talking about decolonizing Christianity and moving from a time when anything non-Western indigenous was demonized, including indigenous ways of life, indigenous healing practices, indigenous healing methods. So I think what gives us hope is that deconstructing that theology, coming to understand, to, to, to demarcate or to differentiate between the Western cultural values in which Christianity was, uh, was spread or was received versus the content, the message itself. So trying to separate the message from the messenger. So we said, no, this was, this was the messenger, not the message. And oh yeah, so those things we threw away, it was just because the messenger was not able to, to, to divorce himself or herself from the message. So it says, if you accept my message, you accept me. Oh yeah, this one has a very good message there for the whole person. So I think we are gradually reviving some things which were thrown away by way of healing methods, healing practices. And this includes uh, herbal medicine and also other rituals and practices that can support facilitate healing. So the Western uh, methods of, of healing should be complementary and not necessarily competitive or to supplement or displace, but they can actually be complementary. Yeah. Thank you, Mai. Um, ben, sorry. Thanks. I think that's a really, really important question. And I think, again, sitting within UNAIDS and, and now working as a consultant with WHO, I think it's very important that we distinguish um, some of the nuances around this. It's, it, the Christian mission history has meant that, that Christianity has had a, a history of providing services, health, education, and others, and that that has been part of what it's seen as its mission to serve, serve other countries, but also uh, to, to preach its gospel and to convert people. Um, there's also a stronger infrastructure as part of that. And I think some of the Islamic, uh, Islamic systems also have very strong structures. And so it's easy for the UN to relate and to engage with those infrastructures that exist. Whereas some of the other religious traditions, such as uh, Hinduism and uh, traditional religions, some of the Buddhist traditions and others, don't have that same, same infrastructure uh, in the same way. It's not necessarily as easily mobilized and, and can be much more uh, fragmented. So one point is that it's very important as there's the UN that we work with a, a whole range of different faith communities and each of the voices has the opportunity to be at the table. And then the second point is, and, and that's difficult to do because of that history uh, and the M1 and two have much stronger infrastructures than others. And as I was mentioning before, in the, even in the negotiating space, some have greater access than others. The second piece is then around proselytization. And again, as a neutral UN, it's very important that we work with a range of different faith actors, but that in engaging in, in that collaborative work and in bringing uh, health and healing as part of a collaborative pro pro uh, project, that there isn't proselytization, so that it would be not appropriate for a joint UN and faith uh, approach to then include proselytization as part of that. So there are some sensitive areas where the very raison d'etre for some of the faith-based groups in providing their services are in fact to, to reach out and convert others. 
Uh, and so how do we negotiate that, that territory such that it's, it is neutral and it is a safe place uh, for those who, who want to bring their religious perspectives, but that those are not imposed upon others and that health services are not given at, on, as a condition uh, of conversion to one or other religious faith, uh, whilst at the same time respecting the beliefs and the traditions of those respective faiths. So I think it's a very complicated minefield that we're working in. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why some uh, secular actors don't want to work with faith-based organizations at all. But I think that's partly why within this, this, the frameworks for engagement of both UNAIDS and, um, and now WHO, we've put the, the importance of respecting religious belief, not undermining it, not ridiculing it, um, and also respecting human rights and gender and, and scientific evidence. And within that, that also means that uh, in projects that are joint projects, then that, that we don't use a, uh, a service delivery to openly proselytize. Uh, so just, I think, to, to try and demarcate a little bit around what is a difficult and complex field. Thank you so much, Savi. Ben? Yeah, just to, to um, build a little bit on... Um what Maya was saying before is um, I think some of what he's capturing there were the dreams originally of the primary healthcare movement in the 60s and 70s that would go beyond like the rigidity of a lot of tertiary care that had been previously built by missions that actually primary care could be part of communities and work with communities and understand them a lot better I remember um, I met uh, a global health giant a guy a Ghanaian guy called Fred Sai and um, I was talking to him a few years ago now, and he's um, telling me that, uh, you know, what he'd been doing in, in, the, in the UN and and, he'd, and the kind of things he'd been doing over a long time. And it, it looks something that he did in 1971, where he said that the, um, the next public health worker would have to be an anthropologist, a sociologist, you know, an understander of communities as well as a medical practitioner, because actually it's kind of what Sally was saying earlier. How do we listen well? How how are relationships built effectively in communities? And I think there's huge amounts of work still to be done, but I think there's also um, there's also kind of a, a taking back up of that of that original hope that a primary healthcare movement had in the '60s, uh, and that and that in some ways did um, challenge some of the kind of more limiting ways that healthcare was practiced before that by missions. Um, but yeah, I think there's so much more to talk about here. But yeah, I've, I've personally really enjoyed and thanks so much to the other panelists and what they've shared. It's been really interesting for me. Thank you so much. Um, we've run out of time. Can I give you a chance to give like a 30 second final words if you have any to, to our, our speakers, Saladin and my. Well, my microphone's off, so I'll just, I'll just close with saying a, a really big thank you to Indrajit, uh, Sanjoy, uh, yourself, Harvey, and the other speakers on the panel with me, Mwai and Ben, uh, and those of you who are listening in, it's been a, a rich, rich discussion and a very, uh, and a great honour to be a part of this. Thank you so much to all of you, and uh, I do hope we'll be able to continue that conversation uh, moving forward, so thank you very much. Thanks, Sally. Ben, Mwai. Yeah, for me also is a big thank you and uh, an honor that we can I can contribute and uh, that we should actually I look forward to more engagement on uh, on this topic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I think we'll be thinking about this for a while. Um, yeah, and thank you for everyone that organized that. I think it's in these spaces, the kind of dialogue that happens that really does help us and not only inspire us for uh, what the future can be, but also challenge us to think about what, what are we hoping for and, and what, what are we imagining might be possible as well. Thank you all so much. I uh, really appreciate spending this 90 minutes with you. It's been a very good conversation and I pray that we will keep the conversation going. Thanks, Inrajit. Thanks, Sanjoy. This has been a great day. I really appreciate this. Uh, we come to the end of the event, um, and uh, I, I trust that future events will be communicated from 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 the Center for Global Health Histories at the University of York. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being with us. Thanks. <laughs>